All right, uh, we're going to uh, today to look at James Polk uh, as president. Uh, if you want to, you can pause and we can uh, uh, take and print out your worksheet, print out uh, the other note sheet uh, it would be helpful. Uh, something to think about doing anyway. Uh, there's different, there's space below it to, uh, below it to actually go through and, uh, and take some notes on things that I'm talking about that aren't necessarily on the uh, PowerPoint itself. All right, here we go. Uh, president Polk is, uh, James Polk is probably the most influential president you've never heard of. Uh, and I, I say that, not saying that uh, anyone who's listening is not intelligent and they've never heard of anyone like this, but more than likely you probably haven't heard of this president. And uh, you probably don't realize how influential he was. Uh, in four years, he took the United States from uh, basically just west of uh, the Mississippi River, and he expanded all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, he's extremely influential, extremely, uh, uh, extremely motivated to get these things done, um, and he's also not well liked. <laughs> but we can talk about that uh, in a little bit. All right, uh, Polk was born in 1795, and. Uh, it's kind of a rough life. He kind of lives, uh, lives in, uh, grows up in Tennessee, uh, very much a, a Westerner. Uh, at that time, Tennessee was in the West. Uh, it's important to remember that. Uh, he has gallstones at the age of 17 and has them removed. And I, I put that on there not because, uh, not because uh, you know, it's kind of just a, most people look at it as kind of a useless fact. I put that on there to tell you, show you how tough he is because if you'll notice, he does it without anesthesia, okay? Uh, that's a painful, gallstones are painful anyway, and then to have surgery, it will be cut open without anesthesia, without anything blocking the pain. Uh, this guy is, this guy's a tough guy, and it's gonna show in his political career. In 1835, uh, he becomes a member of the House of Representatives, actually works his way up and becomes the Speaker of the House. Uh, this is in the government class, but if it was, we talked about the Speaker of the House being the most powerful person outside of the president in this country. Uh, basically, today, um, in the line of succession, how it goes is basically if the president dies and the vice president dies, the Speaker of the House becomes president. That's how important the Speaker of the House is. Um, runs for governor in Tennessee in 1839, wins that, uh, and pushes a Democratic agenda. And it's important to remember that. Um, in the age of Jackson, which is what your, uh, what this section is, or this unit is, uh, he, uh, he's pushing a Jacksonian agenda, okay, things that uh, Andrew Jackson might want to do, okay, so that's what, when we talk about Democrats in the age of Jackson, we're talking about Jacksonians. In 1844, there's a new election, and in this election, the biggest debate topic is going to be Texas. Texas has just won its, uh, won its revolution, uh, which hopefully you've already gone through, and you may not have, but uh, uh, we do have a section on that, a uh, lesson on that. Okay, they've won their, uh, uh, they've won their independence, and now they want to become part of the United States. Uh, they want to be annexed by the United States. Uh, Tyler won't do it, so this that becomes a big question uh, in this election. Who's going to uh, be willing to do that? Uh, the Whigs are putting up a guy by the name of Henry Clay, which I'll show a picture of in just a second. And the Democrats are running Martin Van Buren. Uh, Van Buren was president, has already been president for four years. And he's running now again. Democrats are kind of hesitant to, to put him back on the ticket. He's not well liked. If he wasn't well liked, a lot of economic trouble happened when he was president, so uh, there's an idea that he should not be running again. So you have a contested uh, convention, and at the convention, it's seen that he's not well, and he's not someone that they want to run. And so, uh, um, Polk, uh, Polk's name is is entered, and Jackson actually, Andrew Jackson actually supports Polk over Van Buren, which is interesting because. Van Buren was essentially Jackson's right-hand man when he was president. And so uh, for Jackson to throw his weight behind Polk, uh, it proves to a lot of people, oh, 
this guy is the one we need to uh, we need to elect. And so uh, James Polk becomes the the nominee for the Democratic Party. Uh, the election in 1844 is rather contested. You have um, here's Andrew Jackson. I just threw that picture up there. Uh, but here's Henry Clay, and here's Polk. Uh, Polk is known as Young Hickory as one of his slogans, and 54 40 year fight. Old Hickory, or sorry, Young Hickory, is a play on uh, on Old Hickory on uh, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was known as Old Hickory, and so they start calling Polk Young Hickory uh, to get people to think, oh, Andrew Jackson is old. He's reincarnated. He's the younger version. And then you have uh, the 54 40 year fight refers to the 54 uh, 54 degrees north 40 or 54 degrees 40 minutes north. Uh, it's a line of latitude, and we'll talk about what that means in a second, but um, well, we will. Uh, basically, what happens? Polk wins. It's a close election, but Polk wins. Texas becomes a state, and people are happy. <laughs> uh, the first thing that Polk does is he pledges to serve one term, which is kind of uh, unique. Uh, most presidents don't, you know, two terms because George Washington up to this, up to uh, the early 1800s, is the 1900s uh, until the 1950s, and now you can only serve two terms. Uh, by constitutional amendment, but uh, Polk ser pledges to serve one term. He, uh, he has three goals in this uh, first term. First, he wants to control the Oregon Territory. Second, he needs to lower tariffs. Or he wants to anyway. Third, uh, he wants to set up an independent treasury system. And so he sets to work doing that. As to the first, deals with the Oregon Territory. And this territory is, uh, the reason it's, it's important is because it's disputed at this point. It's claimed by Great Britain, and it's claimed by the United States. And the United States claims comes from the Lewis and Clark Expedition. And the British own Canada. And so kind of this idea, where is Canada and where is the United States? People aren't really sure. And so the United States... Uh, so what Polk does is he actually <laughs> threatens war. Uh, if you remember back to the uh, campaign, he talked about 54-40 year fight. Well, what that meant was, if we don't get up to the 54th parallel, or this 54 degrees 40 minutes north, uh, this line right here, uh, we're going to go to war. Well, if you know anything about how, uh, how the United States looks, we didn't get that high. Okay? We don't go that far north. Uh, we go to the 49th parallel, 49th degrees, or 49 degrees. And what um, what happens is he threatens war. Great Britain comes back with a counteroffer at 42 degrees. He says, well, how about we settle at 49? And they do. And that's where the border was set. But that was, if you remember, that was one of his campaign promises. And boom, done. Check that first one off. He's able to control the Oregon Territory. So he moves to a second, uh, second item, uh, to lower tariffs. And uh, a tariff, uh, in case you're not quite sure, is uh, a tariff is a tax on goods coming into a country. And so uh, let's say, well, we have, the, we have the North American Free Trade Agreement right now, NAFTA, with Canada, but let's say we didn't. And so an example might be uh, Canada has wheat. Well, we grow wheat in the United States. Uh, we want people to buy min or, uh, Minnesota, well, not Minnesota wheat, but United States wheat. Okay. In order to do that, we, we're going to say uh, we're going to put a tax on things. So we're going to put a tax on how um, we're going to put a tax on that. Um, on, the, on that wheat so people buy American. Well, the reason you want lower tariffs is because that creates competition. Uh, if you think about economics, competition lowers, uh, increases the supply, which lowers the price. And that's what he wanted to do. Uh, the, back, the backlash to this, though, is that in the midterm elections, two years into his presidency, most of the Democrats are, um, are removed uh, because of this uh, lower tariff. Okay, it's kind of uh, he's they're kind of shown as anti-American because they go against the buy American ideal. Okay. 
but he does get that done. Check it off. Uh, third is the independent treasury. Um, this goes back. This kind of goes back to the bank war, if you remember, with Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson uh, eliminates the Bank of the United States, and the banks that are put up in place of it, it just doesn't work. And so what Pope does, he sets up a number of individual uh, private banks that can kind of run things in uh, a number of different states. And it, it's kind of piecemeal, but it works um, until 1913, uh, when the United States, uh, or Woodrow Wilson as president, sets up the Federal Reserve System, which is what we have today. Cross that off, though. And basically, two years into his presidency, he's done. He doesn't have to worry about it. Well, that means he can do something else. And so what he does is he focuses on manifest destiny. Manifest destiny uh, is this belief, and you know, I'll just read it off the slide. The belief by Americans in the 1800s that it was their right to control land from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And we're talking about the Atlantic to the Pacific Oceans. And uh, this is a picture of kind of this ideal of manifest destiny. The woman in the center uh, is considered to manifest destiny. And then if you notice the number of different uh, things around it, basically uh, this is the east over here. So this is the west over here, and this is kind of uh, untamed land. You can notice here a group of Native Americans. They're being pushed out, okay, pushed out by uh, civilization, okay. And I hope you're getting the sarcasm in your voice. Uh, and that's that was the idea at the time. Okay, but a number of Americans held to that belief. Now the uh, Polk, if you remember, had already gotten the Oregon Territory. Uh, it kind of made that, uh, figured that uh, dispute out with the British. And so, uh, the next thing he has to do is take, uh, take the land, uh, basically, uh, from Texas to California. Uh, he has to go to war. And we'll cover that in the next lesson. Uh, in terms of Polk himself, in 1849, he leaves office. Three months later, he dies. Uh, it's quite tra it's quite tragic, actually, for Pope. But he uh, um, remember at the beginning of the lesson, I said he's not well liked, and the reason is his personality is kind of a conniving, uh, uh, conniving little person who who just he rubs you the wrong way, and he did that for a lot of people. Um, but uh, that being said, if you look at what he was able to do in four years, taking the United States from basically just just past the Mississippi River uh, to all the way to the Pacific Ocean, um, he does a ton of things in his presidency. Uh, and again, he, there's a reason he's in the top ten uh, in terms of influence in the presidency. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email uh, email me at the uh, at the thing provided. I'm also on Facebook. Uh, if you would like, um, good luck.